BBN. YouTubers and fellow hams. Well, this is my promised review of the QRP Labs QCX transceiver kit. Now, if you were uh, interested in watching me build this kit, then down below in the description will be a link to the build video where I uh, start from scratch and completely build the kit. So uh, go watch that if, uh, if you want to see that after this one. Watch this one first. Or watch that one first. Whichever. Anyway, what do we have here? We have a single band QRP transceiver with a lot of features and a few extra bonuses. It is a three to five watt transmitter that depends on your supply voltage from about uh, eight, seven to, well, they say seven to 16 volts. And at about 14 and a half volts, you'll get to five watts. Down at seven or eight volts, somewhere around there, it's gonna be putting out around three watts or less, <clears throat> maybe around two. So uh, you can vary the output by how much voltage you run it with. You could run it off a nine volt battery if uh, you know if that's all you had available and probably get a good half hour to 40 minutes of operation, maybe a little bit longer. It's a very efficient radio. Um, on receive, it's drawing about 70 milliamps or so of current, so that's not very much. Uh, on transmit at 13.6 uh, volts, putting out about four and a half watts, it was drawing about 600 milliamps. So it's a very efficient transmitter. And he gets that efficiency by using a class E amplifier. I won't go into the details on a, what a class E amplifier is. That's a whole nother video. But it's a very efficient amplifier. It's tricky to work with, but very efficient. Uh, my Yezu FT817, for comparison, when it's transmitting at 5 watts, is drawing over an amp, uh, about 1.2 amps or so. Uh, so this is an order of magnitude lighter on your battery when you're transmitting. Um, it's only a single band. You buy the kit per band. And he has versions for 80, 60, 40, 30, 20, or 17 meters. Uh, so you buy the, the kit for the uh, band you want to operate. Um, what other features? A very narrow filter on the receive, a 200 hertz CW filter. Uh, that's great if there's adjoining stations. You can hear to a station, just the station you want to hear. There's somebody there. You can hear where they're strongest. Oh, now he stops. But you get a little ways off and you can hardly hear them. So ad adjacent stations, you'll be able to more easily copy just one or the other. Um, so that's that's a really nice filter and it sounds pretty good there's another one you hear how he drops off when I get just a little ways off now the uh, the thing you have to be careful of when you're operating it is you have to tune slowly because you could very easily go by somebody if they were sending slow and never know they were there because of that narrow filter uh, let's see, what else does this guy have? Uh, it's microprocessor controlled. It's an Atmel AT Mega um, 
processor, the same thing that's in an, uh, an Arduino, basically. Nice digital display here, two-line display. Built-in CW decoder, which is hearing noise spikes right now and just confused. Um, what else do we have in this guy? Uh, most of the standard features you'd expect, A and B VFOs, split operation, receiver incremental tuning. Um, yeah, overall it's a pretty standard uh, trail friendly radio. The kit comes with just the bare board. I put it in this little plastic shell to make it a little easier to play with, a little safer to play with. I didn't have to want to worry about damaging the components. And I carved out the front of the uh, shell so I could put that together and a little bit safer to put in a backpack. It would be difficult to uh, come up with a case for this thing as it sits on the board. I'm gonna see if I can show you what I'm gonna talk about here. You can kind of see how the display is uh, so far up off the board. You would need an enclosure that is going to come out at this clearance and then drop down to a lower clearance for the main board because the knobs and controls are there. It'd be kind of difficult to, to come up with something that would fit it as it is on the board. But he does mention in the manual during the kit build that if you want to locate the controls off board, you can do that. You can take the encoder, pot, these two little micro switch push buttons here, and the display with a ribbon cable, and you could put them off the board in a, in a separate enclosure and have the board just mounted in the enclosure. So you could, you could do that um, if you wanted to. I might still do that someday. Of course, now I'm going to have to desolder everything to uh, locate them off board. <laughs> So it's a decision if you want to make it while you're building the kit is probably a better time to make it. Um, so anyway, um, other features. Well, it has quite a few interesting things going on on the board. Um, aligning the radio, uh, you did not really need any external test gear to align the radio. He routes signals on the board, uses the microprocessor as its own test gear, and all of the alignment procedures are uh, done with signal routing on the board so all you have to do is watch the display and make adjustments and there were only three adjustments four adjustments to make so um, it was a very easy and quick alignment uh, since he's got a microprocessor in there he built in in software a lot of extra goodies it has test gear here <coughs> We have three pins on this header over on the side for a voltmeter that can read up to, I think, 28 volts. Um, the frequency counter can only count up to 8 megahertz, though, so it's kind of limited functionality there. And these inputs go right into the microprocessor, so you'd have to be really, 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 really careful on your on your inputs if you shorted them or got a static discharge or put too high a voltage in you damage the microprocessor so yeah it's got a, a frequency counter and a dvm and there might be some use there but um i'd really be kind of too scared to use them <laughs> i wouldn't want to blow the chip uh the other thing that it's got oh sorry that's rf power input measurement i'm not sure how that works frequency counters over here the other thing it's got is a signal generator. Now that I find pretty useful. And there are two solder pads here on the board for the signal generator output. Now they are, um, one of them is 90 degrees out of phase from the other, but they're basically the same output. What they're doing is he's using this chip, which is an FST3253. Um, it has two clock outputs and he turns those on and sets them to a frequency. So one of these outputs becomes a square wave at the frequency you set. And it'll go from a really low, low, low frequency, I think it's in the kilohertz range, all the way up to 200 megahertz um, selectable. Now that's kind of nice, having a signal source handy. I'm going to use that <clears throat> here at the bench off and on because this is going to be more stable than my uh, old Heathkit generator. It's a square wave and you can't modulate it but it is a signal source, which could be handy. Uh, again, these are direct pins to this chip, and this is a surface mount chip, so you'd have to be really careful how you treat those. If you short them out, you could damage this chip. If you 
feed a DC voltage into them, you could damage this chip. And this is a surface mount chip, so if you damage this, unless you have service mount capabilities, you've bricked your radio. Uh, so what I did to make use of these, on mine, the pins are not there. Now I can't show it to you because I've got this mounted in the shell, but down here on the bottom of the shell you'll see an RCA connector. So what I did was, let me grab a piece of scratch paper, and I'll draw you a picture. Okay, so here's the pin from the chip, all right? Instead of connecting to this for the output of the frequency counter, I took it and I ran it through a 47 picofarad capacitor and a 1K resistor. to an RCA jack. So now if I short this output, I'm only putting a 1K load on the chip and it's not going to mind that. If I accidentally connect this to DC voltage, the capacitor is going to block it. So by doing that, I've protected that little chip and I've brought out an RCA jack that I can use to tap my frequency generator output. Uh, so that way it's safer and I can use this as a signal source. And I'll show you how that works um, here in a little bit. So what else do we want to talk about? The power amplifier is a class E power amplifier. Here's the diagram here with three small FETs that are basically in parallel so they're sharing the current load but essentially it's an extremely high efficiency amplifier, almost as much as 90% efficient. Um, that's why this thing draws so little current when it transmits at only about 600 milliamps to get almost five watts out. A class E amp, and he has waveforms and, and uh, examples in the uh, manual, however, has a very ugly waveform. You can see where the control signal is, is turning on the transistors and it's just a, a nasty spike, you know, is what you're getting for an output. Um, fortunately, his low pass filter, which is a seven element filter, uh, these capacitors help round that off. And uh, I actually tapped the RF on transmit and uh, measured it on the scope. And I'll show you a picture here. And as you can see, it's a nice, clean-looking sine wave coming out of the antenna jack. So uh, it works. It works. The Class E amp is not generating noisy, nasty carrier. Um, that filter's cleaning it right up, and we're getting a nice sine wave out. Um, he shapes the uh, RF output with a real slight delay from key on and key off, so you can see the RF envelope grows over about five milliseconds and then falls over five milliseconds. That's important because that eliminates key clicks. So it does have a very nice clean output. Uh, I've had a few QSOs on it and I've listened to it on a monitoring receiver and it's just a beautiful sounding output. Nice, pure, clean sounding dits and dahs without any clicks. And uh, as I said, power output, he's graphed it here, is gonna vary depending upon your input voltage um, supply voltage and watts. And at about uh, 14 and a half volts we hit 5 watts. You could go higher but you're starting to stress components when you get up there and you risk damaging the radio. Um, at about 9 volts you'll get about one and a half watts. So if you're running it off a 9 volt battery one and a half watts. That's, that's not bad. The uh, controls are pretty straightforward. This is the volume control obviously. There's a little push button here. This is an encoder which also has a push button and a little push button here. And these three buttons work together to control a menuing system where you can select and do things. And there are a lot of things to do. This is the menu cheat sheet here that he gives you with the radio. Those are all menu items. <laughs> There's a lot you can do and control and configure on this radio. 
he, they're all numbered. So there's like menu number one is presets, menu number two is messages, and these are submenus. Three is VFO, and these are submenus with settings. So it's pretty easy to get through the menus to do things. And there's a lot of things you can do. The uh, one press of, of this button is, or no, I'm sorry. Each button has three functions. There's a single press function, a double press but function, and a long press function. So if I hit it with a single click, like in this one, it's gonna set the keyer speed. So if I hit one click, it brings up speed equal, and I can set the keyer speed with the encoder. So there we're at 12 words a minute. And then I just uh, hit any button to exit. A long press will take me into the menu system, which is where I wanted to go, where you can select which menu you want, messages, VFO, keyer, decoder, it has a CW decoder, beacon mode, which has also got whisper capabilities, uh, other that has, oh, various internal tweaks, um, double click delay time for a double tap on the buttons, whether or not you want it to show a battery indicator and what the high and low thresholds are for that battery indicator, the style of cursor, underline or flashing block, and uh, an S meter, and the step value for the S meter plus a reset uh, is in there. Now the S meter seems to tap off the decoded audio signal. I discovered when I was monitoring a station that when I turned down the volume, the S meter dropped back. So I think he's just using the audio signal for the S meter, but that's okay. It's not an accurate S meter. It's just kind of a relative signal strength. Um, there is and then an alignment menu, which has all kinds of configuration options in there for the radio and test equipment where you can turn on the uh, digital voltmeter, frequency counter, um, signal generator, RF power meter, or um, which I think requires an external sensor, uh, or uh, audio level um, meter. So the like, most interesting thing in the test equipment for me is the signal generator. In fact, let me show that to you now. I'm going to enter into that menu. I'm going to go to the signal generator and I'm going to turn on my two meter radio over here. Pardon me while I lean into the shot. Let's set the squelch. Now, when I hit this button, it lets me set the frequency that the signal generator is going to operate on. And you can hear that I'm breaking the squelch on my two meter radio over there. Its antenna is about eight feet away in the other room. And without anything even hooked up to the output, I'm generating enough of a carrier to break the squelch on that two meter radio. So that's kind of cool. Um, like I said, it's a square wave output from the chip, but it gets rounded by my little capacitor resistor insertion. I get a pretty close to a sine wave um, out of it, but it'll be very harmonic rich. And uh, it's about four volts peak to peak uh, by the time it gets to the output. So it's useful. Um, so that's the menuing system. And uh, it's, it's, it's not too hard to navigate. <clears throat> uh, presets, you can have several frequency presets in there. I've got a couple defined. I think you can have eight. Um, messages, no, I'm sorry, 16. You can have 16 presets. Uh, the next menu is messages, where you can define a uh, string of characters you would like it to automatically send for you. For example, here I've got CQ in my call sign as one message. You could have several and then just uh, choose them when you want it to be sent. Uh, in the messages menu, you can also set an interval, which is the amount of seconds to delay between repeating the message, if you're repeating it, and how many times you want it to repeat, 1 to 99 times. The uh, VFO menu lets you uh, set the startup frequencies for the VFOs when you power the radio on, what, where are they going to be, the default tuning rate, um, the uh, RIT 
whether it's on or off and its rate for tuning. And CW mode, meaning um, uh, CW or CW reversed. So is the CW offset going to be to the upper, upper sideband or reversed to the lower sideband? That could be handy if you're trying to work around some interfering stations. Uh, the keyer menu allows you to set the type of keyer. Like right now I've got it set to straight key because I have my straight key hooked up. You can set it to iambic A or iambic B. Um, one note in my build video uh, when I was demonstrating the radio, or no, I'm sorry, my paddles, my, uh, my homemade paddles video where I made these guys. I used this radio to demonstrate the paddles and I made a comment that it did not seem, the keyer in here did not seem to buffer a dot. So if I hit a dash and tapped the dot, it would not insert it, it wouldn't buffer it. Um, that was actually supposed to be that way. That's iambic A mode. Iambic B mode will buffer and let you insert those dots and dashes. And once I switched to iambic B, that problem went away. So that was just operator error. I was set to the wrong mode. Uh, you can set the uh, keyer's default speed, whether or not you want to swap paddle inputs, you know, dot on the left and right or right. Uh, the weight, which is the uh, uh, dit space ratio. Uh, what else we have in here? We have QSK um, settings, full or semi break in. So on full break in, which is where it's at now, there's, well, you can't hear it when we're in code practice mode. It's not really going to transmit. You can kind of hear it. There's static in between the elements. Uh, full QSK, it switches back to receive immediately upon releasing the uh, key or the transmitter. And you can hear between the elements of your sending if the other station is, is sending. That can be distracting in some cases and you can go to semi break in where it just has a delay. When you transmit and release the key, there'll be a short delay before it switches back to receive. So you can send letters um, without hearing the receiving uh, static in between your elements. Um, 4.7 is a practice mode. If I turn that on, the radio will not transmit. It'll just do a side tone like that when I'm keying down so I can use it as a code practice oscillator. Side tone frequency by default is 700 hertz, which matches the center of the audio filter. So by default, if your tone on your side tone matches the tone of the guy you're receiving, he'll be centered in your audio filter. You can change this um, per your own taste, but if you like backed this down to 500 hertz because you liked a lower tone, uh, you'd still want to listen to the, the other station at 700 so he's in the middle of the filter. If you listen to him by tuning down to where he's at 500, he'll actually drop off and you'll start to lose him out of the filter. So. I left it at 700 and I'm just learning to live with that higher pitch. I used to like a lower pitch, but it works. And finally, side tone volume. By default, it's at 100% and it's loud. In the headphones, it was just banging when I was sending. I dropped it back to 50, but that's just personal preference. Uh, the next menu is the decoder menu. And there are some tweaks in here for the CW decoder. Noise blank interval is how many milliseconds a pulse has to exceed before it's considered to be a dit instead of just a spike of noise. By default that was at 10 and I found that I got a lot of uh, ease traveling across the display because the receiver was picking little noise spikes and thinking that they were um, somebody sending an E. I increased it to 20 and that cleaned up the uh, decoder a little bit. Speed averaging is uh, the speed detection it was at 7 by default. I don't know. I got better performance at 10, where it tended to, to pick up on the speed of the station I just tuned to much quicker. Again, preference, you can play around with that. Um, amplitude average is, uh, again, a setting for uh, detection. And it's an average volume level that the uh, signal has to be at before it's considered CW. So you can go in there and you can adjust these things and improve or... or uh, totally screw up your CW decoder, so you might want to make a note of the defaults before you make any changes. Uh, you can enable CW decoding on receive and on transmit. 
So the decoder will be decoding your sending when you're transmitting. You'll see the characters going across there if your sending is clean enough. Um, so yeah, you can, uh, you can make all kinds of changes in there. Beacon mode. I won't go too much into beacon mode. Um, I'll just tell you that it, it, it provides a CW beacon where you can have it send one of the messages over and over again. Um, but it also provides a function for whisper beaconing, um, WSPR, weak signal propagation reception. For whisper to really work well, you would need the add-on GPS module for this to make it frequency accurate and time accurate. You can go in and you can set the time and you can set your frequency and do whisper broadcasts with this without that module. But you're going to have to get your time really, really precise and hope the clock doesn't drift too much uh, on you. Uh, if you really want to use this as a whisper transmitter or beacon, um, get his GPS module and hook it up. And that'll just make it absolutely dead on accurate for time and frequency. Um, alignment menu, I mentioned that. That just does the, uh, all the alignment steps. One note in here, in the alignment menu, item 8.5, reference frequency. Okay, there's two crystal oscillators on here, a 20 and a 27 megahertz oscillator. This is telling the, mic you're, you're telling the microprocessor this is the actual frequency of the 27 megahertz um, oscillator. The crystal's marked 27 megahertz, but oscillators are never exactly dead on. And the radio is going to use this reference oscillator for the frequency synthesizer. So measuring that crystal oscillator with an accurate frequency counter and putting its actual frequency in here will allow the microprocessor to accurately display your transmit frequency. AB4Z calling CQ. We're going to try to answer. Thanks for calling. You're five seven nine. QTH North Carolina. CC number one one three nine two eight T This is SKCC number 13928T.
Yes. Good copy. Kevin. But QSB. My rig is IC7300 and antenna ground plane iOS WK Told him I missed this question. Oh, he came up. Nice signal for four watts. Nice. so. Will. Oh, he's faded out again. There it comes.
So that was AB4Z down in North Carolina. So uh, yeah, the little radio works pretty good. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the kit. Uh, it's, you know, like I say, it, it's a nice low power radio if you wanted to take it out camping or on the trail. Single band, which is the downside, but you know, you pick something like 40 or 20 and you're, you're going to have some time to get some contacts with it. Uh, some test equipment built into it that's, you know, semi-useful. I think the signal generator is, again, probably the most useful aspect of that. I'd be worried about damaging it on the other inputs if you weren't careful, you know, or built some protection in yourself. Um, pros, low power consumption, high efficiency, lots of features. Uh, cons, um, I guess the fact that it's all just a single PC board without an enclosure and it's not really put together by default to be friendly to an enclosure. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to just take the PC board out and pop it in a backpack. You know, it wouldn't last. You'd screw these uh, inductors up, you know, or, or damage it otherwise. Um, aside from that, it performs well. It uh, receiver sounds great. Uh, transmitter puts out well. Um, I think it's uh, for forty-nine dollars. It's a heck of a kit, and I'd uh, I'd give it a thumbs up. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.